Dan Sinor, thanks for being here. Good to be with you. You as were always. in Israel last week, so catch us up because there was news over the weekend that Israel was actually able to rescue two more hostages. Yeah, I would say, uh, look, my the trip to Israel was uh, extremely heavy, heavier than I expected it to be. Is uh, this the first time you've been back? Yeah, it's okay. the first time I've been back since October 7th. Um, I mean, you just think about a country that, as we've talked about, experienced in one day the equivalent of 29 9-11s, the equivalent of having 50,000 people, if you could proportion it to the U.S. population, 50,000 people slaughtered, maimed, not to mention the proportional equivalent of thousands of people being held hostage. So everywhere you go in the country, you're interacting with the trauma and the hangover, even mm -hmm. still four months into mm -hmm. it. At four months right now, this will be, and it's no, no end in sight, Israel's longest war. Mm. And... And so there's the professional military. Then there's all the reservists. Many of the people getting killed in Gaza right now are reservists, people who have their lives. They're working at tech companies. They're working as cab drivers. They're working in you know, hotels and restaurants. They're doctors and teachers, and they're fighting in Gaza, and they're getting killed, and they have spouses and children and lives, and they got plucked into this war, and they're never coming back. Mm -hmm. Or I went to Sheba Medical Center, which is the one of the 10 most impressive and, and highest-ranked hospitals in the world, and uh, where all the wounded are going right now. There's over 4,000 severely wounded. So I spent time with all these people who, you know, who mm. had lives, had civilian lives, and now they're trying to figure out how to walk with, you know, one leg or no arms or no hearing or live with no hearing. And this is and this thousands of people who are fighting, who are just getting severely wounded. It's going to be a whole generation. And we spent time with families of the hostages. I know you've had on your show families mm -hmm. of these hostages. I, I don't care what anybody says. No matter how many times you meet with them, it's just each time it's just um, it's gut-wrenching. And then just seeing friends and family who've also been directly um, affected by all of this. So in that sense, it's it's heavy. The The trauma hangs over everywhere you go. I'm still upbeat, as you know, about Israel, and I think the country's incredibly resilient. But I, I will say you're there and you spend time with people. You go down to Kfar Aza, which is the kibbutz, one of the kibbutz, kibbutz, kibbutzim that was just just terrorized. Went there, went to the Nova Music Festival site, which was actually the, the most chilling part of the trip, I think, because um, you could just really visualize the killing field. Um, so it was heavy. And then we had this news that you're referring to over the last um, 24 hours where the IDF had been working on this operation for some time, I've now learned, um, to go rescue these two hostages that were not in a tunnel. They were on the second floor of a, like an, almost like an apartment complex. And they had been, these two men, I think 61 years old and 7 mm -hmm. years old, and they had been hidden out there for, you know, over, what, 120 plus days. Um and uh, your anyways, so the the operation was extraordinary. The, the the commander for the Southern Command for the IDF gave the go ahead uh, yesterday, Sunday, and um, they had been waiting for the right circumstances. They had been training for it for some time, and the irony is it's in Rafa, which is becoming a point of contention between the Biden administration and the Israeli government about whether or not Israel sh can and should go into Rafah, and if they go into Rafah, how they go into Rafah. The Israeli leadership, and everyone I met with in the Israeli leadership, from right to left, uh, every member of the War Council, everyone, every political faction that represents the different factions in the government, they all think they have to go into Rafah. You can't finish, the, Hamas will remain intact if they don't go into Rafah. And the administration is not saying no, but is saying they're putting a lot of constraints on Israel going into Rafah which is right there at the Egyptian border. And the idea that you're having this debate and then there's this news that Israel has to go in and get hostages out of Rafah and you're sort of like, wait a minute, Israel has, there are Israeli hostages in Rafah and Israel is being told they can't go into Rafah and it sort of triple underlines how outrageous it is that Israel is being told how it can fight this war. So um, last weekend, Biden called Netanyahu and to have this conversation. I don't yeah. know exactly how that went. Then you have the, it's so interesting the way this administration has pushed forward because on the record, they'll say, um, you know, we're very concerned. We're very concerned. 
Then you used to hear that there's more support behind the scenes, but now they're leaking out that Biden is more concerned about Netanyahu than ever and undermining him with anonymous quotes in the press. So it does make me wonder, like, sir, the, Mr. President, the uh, American hostages could be in Rafa. Right. Right? I mean, right. If, well, I would we say, don't know that, right? No, they absolutely could be in Rafa. And not just undermining them with background quotes. Now, for the first time last week, we had the Israel being undermined with on-the-record quotes. So if you go back over the last few months, there have been some incredibly impressive statements from the administration that I have publicly praised. John Kirby has been extraordinary from the White House podium, basically saying Israel is having to fight a war under circumstances that no modern military has had to deal with dealing with an enemy that hides in a civilian population that has built 350 miles of tunnels underground that are impossible to get to. No no counterinsurgency, no military, no one, no one has had to deal with this. John Spencer, who's the head of urban warfare at West Point, just wrote this piece where he really lays out, he goes through every major war and counterinsurgency operation modern times. He can't find another example of the conditions that Israel has to face with, a, with an enemy hiding in a dense civilian population with tunnels underneath. I mean, it's just unbelievable. Willing to use human shields. And um, and so the administration officials, Kirby, Matt Miller at the State Department, Tony Blinken, um, the president himself over the last few months have defended Israel and, 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 and made the case that Israel is dealing with extraordinary circumstances. And then suddenly last week, we had three things that I thought were shockers. One, the president, as you know, in that press conference, I think it was on Thursday, where he, where he was walking away and then he was asked a question about Israel and he came back and he said uh, Israel's response in Gaza has been over the top, which is code for disproportionate. It's the first time the administration has used that language. Certainly it's the first time President Biden has used that language. And it's just not true. How do we know it's not true? Yeah. Because they've been saying it's not true. For the last few months, they the ones have been saying, mm -hmm. in, in fact, on my podcast, my next episode, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to play all the clips the administration has said over the last few months defending Israel against charges of, of uh, disproportionality. And now Biden himself is saying Israel's response has been disproportional. Uh, Blinken said something that I thought was outrageous. He said, uh, he said what Hamas did to Israel on October 7th was dehumanizing. But just because what Hamas did to Israel was dehumanizing doesn't mean Israel has a, quote, license to dehumanize the Palestinians. What happened to Israel's fighting an impossible situation? What happened to if Hamas wants to end this war, they can end it tomorrow by releasing the hostages and surrendering? What happened to, these were their arguments. Now suddenly Israel's dehumanizing a population. And the third thing that Blinken said is he said that the path to a Palestinian state must be, his words, time-bound and irreversible. Meaning we're gonna launch a timeline regardless of the Palestinians' behavior, regardless of whether or not they can demonstrate they're ready to build their own state. And we're going to put on a timeline. It's not going to be milestone-based, and it's going to be irre irreversible, which means October 7th, if Blinken sticks to that, will be the Palestinian Independence Day. They will be able to look back and say, this is the day we got a Palestinian state. I would say those three statements this past week were outrageous. And this is coming from someone who has defended, I've defended Biden and, and criticisms against Biden on this issue because I generally think since mm -hmm. October 7th, the administration has been responsible. I think this week was bad. I think they're responding to domestic U.S. politics. I think they're worried about the progressive base. So I'm trying to give them a little bit of the benefit of the doubt that they won't actually do as much damage as their rhetoric suggests. But make no mistake, the rhetoric is damaging. And what also, also the media covering the Palestinian... Um, statements that say, you know, don't hurt us in Rafa, that all these people are going to be injured. Israel is aware and they're worried about that. Then give back the hostages because they're there in Rafa. Right. So, so you're talking about a little over 1 million people who are in southern Gaza. There are many things you could do. Uh, you could give back the hostages and surrender the leadership. Uh, or, or turn, or the Palestinian people could turn on the leadership mm -hmm. and try to enter because mm -hmm. they know where a lot of these people are. Egypt could create a humanitarian corridor for many of these Palestinians. They're not interested in doing that. So, so right there at the Egyptian border, the Egyptian border is like slammed shut. Egypt does not want any Palestinians coming in to the Sinai, into Egypt. Uh, they're worried about Hamas coming in. So they've slammed the door. So there's so many ways 
Palestinians could turn on Hamas. There are so many ways the Arab world, particularly Egypt, could put pressure on Hamas. There are so many ways that Hamas's leadership could end this thing. They're not interested in it. There are still, depending on how you calculate it, four to six battalions of Hamas that are that will not be eradicated unless Israel can get into Rafah. And Israel is not going to stop until they eradicate Hamas and get back their hostages. What about UNRWA? This is the UN Relief Agency. Who, Mike Tobin, our reporter in uh, in Israel, today he showed these amazing tunnels yeah. with, with tiling, yeah. you know. Um, and the UNRWA organization was upstairs. Right. So, so should the United States and others just pull funding from that agency completely? Yeah, so it's 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 the entire mo- the most sophisticated and um technologically sophisticated and dense data center for Hamas is underneath the UNRWA headquarters. Mm-hmm. So here, j- just to take a step back. The UN has the United Nations has a refugee organization, relief organization that works on behalf of all refugees around the world, no matter where they're from. All right. It's the UN Commission on Refugees, High Commission on Refugees. The only exception to that commission are the Palestinians. For some reason, the UN gives a a special organization, which is the UN Relief uh, and Works uh, Agency. The UN gives a special agency just for the Palestinians, A. B, under every other category of refugees, a refugee is someone displaced by war or whatever, uh, natural disaster, whatever it may be, and has nowhere to go, with one exception, the Palestinians. The Palestinians can settle somewhere else, right? But they have relief, a refugee status for the rest of their lives. So they have a right to, quote unquote, return to Israel, I guess, uh, for the rest of their lives. So, you know, Bella, Bella Hadid's dad, the the model, the Palestinian American model, her father is technically who lives in LA, I think, is a is a refugee. He is he is at some some point ha- has the right, according to these their own rules, to come back to Israel. Um, so the refugee status never ends. For every other designation, refugee status ends, except the Palestinians. A. B if you are a refugee, you are a refugee. It doesn't matter it doesn't mean that every one of your descendants becomes a refugee too. So at the time of the end of the Israeli War of Independence, 1948, between then and 1950, the UN estimates there were about 700,000 Palestinian refugees that were dislocated. Mm-hmm. Number varies a little bit. It's not clear exactly how they calculated. Whatever. Let's say 700,000. Today, according to the UNRWA website, there are 5.9 million Palestinians. Like, so that means that every refugee that winds up wherever has a child, a grandchild, or they can adopt, and all those people become refugees too, who all have the... So this thing has been so politicized against Israel, and and as we now know, totally corrupted and captured by Hamas. I think there obviously has to be humanitarian programs to deal with the Palestinians in Gaza. No one's suggesting that those are not needed. What we are suggesting is the UN agency and the UN structure is ludicrous, Mm -hmm. dangerous, an organ of Hamas, it should be dismantled and be replaced. And to the, any argument to the contrary is just, it's it's like, it's allowing another organ of Hamas to continue to endure. A- am I correct that 80% of the funding comes from the United States? Yeah, something like that. A majority of the funding comes from the U.S. I mean, yeah. That's yeah. unacceptable. Yeah. The funding has been suspended, and I think it should be suspended indefinitely.